Okay, uh, so now having uh, obtained a, a big picture viewpoint of what we are going to uh, study in this particular course, uh, let us uh, have a brief uh, recap of uh, what mathematical uh, tools you know like that we would be required. Okay. Uh, so the uh, so uh, uh, as we discussed you know like we are going to deal with uh, 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 what we call a single input single output linear time and causal dynamic systems right that we are going to characterize using spatially homogeneous uh, uh, dynamic continuous time deterministic models. Typically these models take the uh, form of an uh, ordinary differential equation right. So, so the uh, first uh, sort of uh, mathematical tools you know like that we would require for this particular course is the uh, what to say is a basic working knowledge of uh, uh, ODEs right. Uh, so, uh, as we are going to consider uh, you know like more specifically you know like uh, linear ODEs with constant coefficients right. So, uh, why linear ODEs with constant coefficients you know like uh, uh, typically what happens is that like uh, the linearity comes into play because uh, we are dealing with linear systems we are dealing with constant coefficients because of time invariance. Okay. So, the concept of time invariance uh, essentially uh, implies that you know like if we are dealing with uh, ordinary differential equations the coefficients uh, of the terms okay, in that equation uh, are going to be constants right. So, that, that essentially is a, is a consequence of time invariance. Okay. So, that is why we are considering uh, linear ODEs with constant coefficients right. So, let us uh, consider some specific ordinary differential equations. Okay. Uh, but I, I suggest that uh, uh, all of us go back and recap uh, what we learned in a uh, first uh, engineering mathematics course on ordinary differential equations right uh, which would really be helpful okay. So, but I am just going to recap a few important uh, concepts okay that is what I am going to uh, do here. So, if I uh, if we consider a first order uh, uh, what to say uh, in ho oh sorry homogeneous OD. of the form of this form let us say you know like I consider uh, d y d t okay, plus uh, let us say a y d y t equals 0. Okay. So, let us say uh, we consider a linear first order homogeneous O d of this particular form okay, where of course, a is a constant parameter right constant real number all of us know that uh, the solution to this OD uh, is of the form you know like C e power minus a t right. So, that is something which all of us uh, know right. Uh, so, <coughs> where of course, I can write C uh, uh, as uh, essentially y 0 ok. So, y 0 is the initial condition ok. So, this is an initial value problem. So, given that the independent uh, variable is time, so I can write the same solution as y 0 e power minus a t right. So, why do we have an exponential solution to begin with you know like how do we get this we just substitute uh, y of t of the form e power uh, m t and then we get m to be minus a right. So, that is how we get the solution for this particular homogeneous uh, uh, linear OD and why should we have exponential solutions and why should we fit a exponential func uh, substitute an exponential function to begin with uh, because uh, it has been shown that uh, uh, the uh, a solution exists for linear ODEs with constant coefficient and the unique solution takes the form of uh, exponential functions ok. So, in other words the exponential function is the uh, only solution for uh, linear ODEs with constant coefficients ok. So, that is why we are essentially substituting uh, a solution form uh, that corresponds to an exponential function to get this uh, uh, to solve this uh, equation. Okay. So, if we have now a first order uh, inhomogeneous OD okay, of the form let us say d y 
uh, d t plus a y of t is equal to let us say some b of u of t. Let us say we have some equation of this form, right. So, what is the solution to this equation? Uh, we know that it is going to comprise of two parts, okay. So, the first one is uh, due to the initial condition, okay. So, it is going to be y naught e power minus a t, okay, plus uh, integral uh, 0 to t e power minus a t minus tau b u tau d tau okay like uh, see i am just using the symbols corresponding to our course right so please remember you know like for us uh, to keep in focus what we are doing you know like we are looking at a system uh, to which we provide an input u of t and an output y of t right so i i am writing whatever equations i am taking in terms of the input and the uh, output variables okay so that's what i am doing right uh, so, um, this is a, a solution to this particular uh, uh, inhomogeneous ODE. So, we can immediately see that there are two components uh, to the solution. The first uh, part of the solution uh, is due to uh, initial conditions, okay. So, this part is uh, typically uh, referred to as what is called as a uh, free response, okay. The second part is the solution uh, due to the input provided, okay. Uh, this response is what is called as a uh, forced response, okay. So, uh, we see that in general, you know, like uh, uh, we have uh, two components to the output function, okay, like uh, when we model systems using this class of equations, okay, like the first part is what is called as a free response, uh, which comes in, you know, like uh, due to the non-zero initial conditions. The second part is what is called as a force response, which comes uh, due to the input that is provided to the system, okay. So, uh, given these uh, uh, responses, uh, the uh, the point is how do we use uh, this to analyze the class of systems under study, okay. So, we see that you know like once I uh, model the class of systems that we are looking at in this course, uh, we would get uh, linear ODEs of uh, with constant coefficients, right. And then uh, we, we see that you know like uh, given any input you know like I can use uh, essentially solutions to the ODE to calculate what would be the corresponding output from the uh, system, okay. So, that is something uh, uh, which is very important to us, okay. And in this process, you know, like what we are going to do is essentially uh, use what is called as a Laplace transform that helps us to go from the time domain to the complex uh, domain and uh, essentially convert problems involving ordinary differential equations into problems involving algebraic equations, okay, so that they are easier to work out by hand. And then like we take the inverse Laplace transform to come to the uh, time domain, right. So, let us uh, look at uh, uh, what to say complex variables, then we will come back to ODEs and then like we will uh, uh, see how we uh, uh, use uh, Laplace transform on ODEs and then like uh, process them, okay. So, that is something which we are going to come back to, okay. So, uh, we consider a complex variable uh, of the form. <coughs> Let us consider a complex variable S uh, which of the form sigma plus j omega where sigma is some real number, uh, omega is a real number and j squared is equal to minus 1, okay. So, I am just using j you know like instead of i. Okay, so that's what uh, uh, that's how we will uh, represent complex variables, and uh, typically what we will do is that like we will uh, draw what is called as an S plane, uh, which essentially can be used to graphically uh, represent a complex number. So that will have two axes, you know, like what is called as the real axis and the imaginary axis, and uh, we use this to graphically represent any uh, complex number. Okay, and uh, a complex function uh, f of s 
is a complex valued function of x okay so that's what it is yes okay and typically we write f of s to be equal to some f r real part of sigma omega plus j f imaginary part of sigma omega okay so that's a typical split okay see for example uh, let us say you know like uh, <coughs> we consider uh, you know like f of s to be let us say s squared right I can rewrite this as sigma plus uh, j omega whole squared this can be rewritten as sigma squared minus omega squared plus j times uh, 2 sigma omega right. So, this part is f r of sigma omega and this is f i of sigma omega ok. Now, a, a few definitions right a, a complex valued function f of s is set to be analytic in a given domain if f of s and all its derivatives exist in that domain ok that is very important ok and another definition is that points in the s domain where f of s is not analytic are called singular points or poles ok. So, that is uh, another uh, example. So, say for example, you know like if we consider uh, f of s to be equal to 1 by s plus 1 ok. We can immediately note that uh, uh, s equals minus 1 is a, a singular point or pole <coughs> okay, of this particular function right. So, that is an example okay. and uh, there are what are called as uh, Cauchy Riemann conditions uh, which are essentially used to evaluate whether a given function f of x is analytic. So, what are these two conditions? There are two conditions here. Uh, so, the first condition is uh, the partial derivative of f r with respect to sigma should be equal to the partial derivative of f i f i with respect to omega. Second condition is that the partial derivative of f i with respect to sigma should be equal to the negative of the partial derivative of f r with respect to omega ok. So, those are the two uh, Cauchy Riemann conditions and uh, another uh, uh, what to say set of equations once again as I told you I am just recapping what we would have already learnt in a basic course in engineering mathematics. Uh, I am only writing down whatever is relevant for our course you know which we will use as we go along. Uh, so, what are called Euler's relationships you know like uh, so we know that uh, uh, if if I have a, an exponential with a complex exponential, let us say if I have e power j omega t, I can write it, uh, re write it as cos omega t plus uh, j sin omega t and e power minus j omega t is going to be equal to cos omega t minus j sin omega t ok. So, that is the Euler's relationships ok. From these two relations uh, we can immediately see that cos omega t is going to be equal to e power j omega t plus e power minus j omega t divided by 2. 
sin omega t is going to be equal to e power j omega t minus e power minus j omega t divided by 2j. Okay, so that is uh, the Euler's relationship. Okay. So, now moving on uh, we look at what are called as uh, Laplace transform. Okay. So, <coughs> so, what is this Laplace transform? Okay. So, uh, let me uh, write down the definition of a Laplace transform of a real valued function f of t. Uh, so, the Laplace transform of uh, f of t uh, which is in the time domain is integral uh, minus infinity to plus infinity f of t e power minus s t dt. Okay. Uh, so, here s is the complex variable. So, this is what is called as a bilateral Laplace transform uh, because uh, uh, the integration is carried out from uh, minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, so, sorry, bilateral Laplace transform. Okay, on the other hand, uh, you know, like in this particular course, you know, like we would use what is called as a unilateral Laplace transform because typically we are not, uh, uh, what to say, we are going to start a process or a, uh, what to say, analysis of a system from time t equals zero. So we make the lower limit as zero. Uh, and uh, consequently, we will go from 0 to infinity uh, f of t e power minus s t dt. Okay. So, that is going to be the uh, what is called as a unilateral um, Laplace transform. <coughs> okay. So, that is the unilateral Laplace transform. So, uh, uh, and uh, there is something called as the inverse Laplace transform which essentially uh, maps any given function in the complex domain back to its uh, function in the time domain. Okay. Uh, uh, but typically we calculate the inverse Laplace transform uh, using what is called as a, a partial fraction expansion rather than using the uh, definition per se. Okay, that is what we are going to uh, follow in this particular uh, course also. Uh, so, uh, before uh, uh, we move on to use uh, 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 to learn and use uh, how we would we are going to apply Laplace transform in our particular course, uh, I am just going to point out a few important functions uh, that are going to be uh, useful to us okay, like in this particular course. And uh, so, uh, so let me call them as some typical inputs that we are going to look at. Why is this important or some standard inputs let more than uh, uh, typical okay, let uh, we can also call them as standard inputs. Okay. So, uh, typically you know like uh, please note that you know like we are going to have an input uh, u of t and we get an output uh, y of t right. So, that is our notion of a system right. So, by and large you know like if you want to analyze systems you know like uh, and various designs of uh, uh, choices uh, for systems. Uh, if you want to have a, a proper analysis done you know like by, uh, typically we need to give some standard input so that we evaluate the system response right. If I design let us say n systems for an application right. So, I can evaluate them provided I give the same input to the uh, designs right. So, for that purpose you know like we use some standard uh, inputs okay, let us look at uh, each one of them. Okay. So, then we will come back to Laplace transform. So, first we will look at what is called as the unit impulse input. Uh, so, what is this unit impulse input? Uh, let us say uh, uh, okay, this is also called as the Dirac delta function. So, what is this uh, unit impulse input? Uh, Let us say we consider uh, u of t uh, to be a signal of this particular form. Okay. Let us say at around time t equals 0 for a very, very small time interval uh, let us say minus epsilon by 2, 2 plus epsilon by 2 uh, the uh, magnitude of the signal is 1 by epsilon. So, immediately we see that uh, the area of this uh, rectangular signal is 1. right? So that is how the uh, adjective unit comes into being. 
right. So, uh, then let us say you know like we shrink this epsilon and make it 10 to 0, right. What is going to happen is the following, right. So, the input is essentially going to just jump to a very high magnitude instantaneously and come back to 0 instantaneously, okay. So, this is what is called as the Dirac delta function uh, which is essentially denoted by delta t, okay. Delta t is this uh, unit impulse input, okay. So, <coughs> so essentially uh, we want to uh, 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 provide, uh, let us say suppose if I provide the uh, unit impulse input uh, uh, as the input to the system, the corresponding uh, output is what is called as an impulse response, okay. So, what we uh, get uh, of course, I can also say unit impulse response, okay in general. So, what is unit impulse response? Unit impulse response is nothing but the output of the system when I provide a unit impulse input to the system, okay. Uh, another input which is uh, uh, typically used in systems analysis is what is called as a unit step input. So, what is this uh, unit step input? So, as the name suggests, you know like uh, so we have let us say time t and uh, u of t, what we are going to do is that like at time t equals 0 we give a step input to the system that is of magnitude 1, okay. So, this is what is called as a unit step input. So, the output that we get from this system is what is called as a uh, unit step response, okay. So, that is the output of the system when we uh, provide a step as the input, okay. So, we see that the impulse response and the step response are going to be very valuable to us, okay, like as we go along, you know, like we are, in, we are going to use them in lot of analysis, right. So, the third uh, uh, standard input that we would consider is what is called as a unit ramp input. What is this unit ramp input? Unit ramp input is nothing but uh, u of t is equal to t, okay. So, that is what it is, okay. So, that is a unit ramp. So, the input just scales like t, okay. So, uh, that is why we call it as a, uh, the slope is 1, that is why we call it as a unit ramp input, okay. And the fourth uh, standard input that we typically provide, uh, of course, uh, when we provide uh, the unit ramp as the input, you know like the output that we get is what is called as a unit ramp. Uh, response, okay. And the uh, fourth class of inputs that we typically provide uh, or what are called sinusoidal inputs, okay. Sinusoidal inputs uh, as the name suggests, you know we provide sinusoidal functions as uh, uh, inputs of varying frequencies cos omega t you know like sin omega t, you know like uh, we are going to have input which are going to be uh, cos and sines, right, uh, whose frequencies are also can be different, right. And uh, because uh, we will later see that if we have what, what is called as a stable system, right, stable LTA system, uh, the, uh, uh, the steady state output of uh, such systems when we provide a sinusoidal input is also going to be a sinusoid of the same frequency and that information is used in analysis. and. Uh, that analysis that we do is what is called as frequency response analysis, okay. So, frequency response uh, has to do with uh, you know like what we study about the steady state response of stable LTA causal systems uh, when we subject them to uh, uh, what to say sinusoidal inputs, okay. So, that is what uh, we are going to uh, look at, right. And uh, so, these are four uh, common uh, inputs that are typically provided impulse, step, uh, ramp and uh, sinusoids, okay. Of course, uh, in general you know a, an input can be in any arbitrary uh, combination of these inputs and that is where linearity helps us, you know like see uh, there are two reasons why we study uh, the response of systems to standard inputs. So, that like we form a, we have a uniform baseline to study systems and also we extract 
uh, and define parameters uh, for system performance which are uh, based upon one type of input, right? So that's very important. Okay, so that we can quantify system performance. So that's something which we are going to see. We will see that you know we are going to use step response and frequency response to essentially define parameters that quantify system performance. Uh, that is one reason. And second, uh, you know, like in general, any arbitrary input you know can be usually written as a linear combination of these inputs. So since we are dealing with linear systems, you know, like once we know the output to these standard inputs, we in theory at least you know like we can calculate the uh, what to say. Uh, the output to any arbitrary input that we provide. Okay, so that's that's uh, another perspective of why we study the uh, standard uh, the standard responses. Okay, and uh, before we return back to <coughs> want to say uh, the uh, uh, discussion on Laplace transform. Okay, I, I we just discussed the standard inputs, and uh, there are two uh, what to say important. Uh, uh, aspects that are critical in control design. Okay, so let me uh, point them and uh, discuss what they are. The first one is what is called a stability. Okay, so we want to design stable systems. Okay, and if a system is unstable to begin with, we want to stabilize systems using feedback. Okay, that's one reason why we uh, design control systems. So whenever we design dynamic systems of the class that we are considering, first we want those systems to be stable. Okay? So, we will shortly define what notion of stability we are going to use in this particular course. Uh, the second thing is once we design stable systems, uh, we want to evaluate how th th those systems perform. So, we are going to be interested in what is called as performance. Okay? So, for us stability is first of all paramount. Once we have stable systems, we worry about performance. And the notion of stability that we are going to use in this particular course is what is called as bounded input, bounded output stability. Okay? So, what does that mean? It is abbreviated as BIBO. Okay? That is the abbreviation of bounded input, bounded output stability. Okay? So, what, what is meant by bounded input, bounded output stability? Please know that uh, uh, our visualization of a system is an entity to which we provide an input u of t and we get an output uh, y of t, right. So, that is that is our visualization of a system, right. What bounded input, bounded output stability says is that uh, if I provide any bounded input to the system, uh, the corresponding output should be bounded in magnitude for all time. Okay? So, that is the notion of bounded output, bounded output stability. Okay? So, uh, let me write down the definition. So, a system of course, belonging to our class is said to be uh, BIBO stable if uh, given a, any input u of t such that the magnitude of u of t is less than some positive uh, real scalar m which is obviously finite that is what this means okay, for all t uh, if given the system output, the output of the system. is always bounded in magnitude. So, that is magnitude for all t. Okay? That is the magnitude of y of t is less than some less than or equal to some n less than infinity okay? <coughs> for all t. Of course, here m and n are finite positive real numbers. Okay? So, that is what uh, they are. Okay? So, this is the notion of uh, bounded input, bounded output stability. Okay? That is what uh, we will consider in this particular course. Okay? 
so uh, these uh, these ideas are extremely important. Okay, like so when we design controllers, we want to ensure that the system that we design, the closed loop system that we design, is first of all stable in the sense, and then it performs. Okay. And how do we get performance? Uh, for performance, we are going to use a step response, impulse response, frequency response, and so on. Right? We'll we'll learn about them as we uh, go along. Okay. So, but this is something which is extremely important. Okay.